Jimmy, this podcast, this is for middle school, high school students and their teachers. These are busy individuals. They don't have time for fluff. So we're going to jump right into this. This is a question that we like to ask at the start of every interview. It's a super important question because it's a question that our listeners want the answer to. And it also helps set the tone for the rest of the interview. So Jimmy, pineapple on pizza, uh, yes or no? No, never. I feel very strongly about that. All right. That's three no's in a row and it's starting to shift the trend. Do you have a favorite pizza? Is it just pineapple specifically you don't like or? I, maybe I'm weird, but I just like cheese pizza. No. I feel like the more stuff you put on it, the less, the less it tastes like pizza. And I just, that's fair. It's good with me. My favorite pizza right now is Domino's like Brooklyn style pizza. And it's oh, just nice. like flat bread, big piece of pepperoni cheese, nothing fancy about it. So that's awesome. I can agree with you on that one. All right. Well, Jimmy, I think you have to make up uh, a little bit because I know our listeners love the pineapple and the pizza as well. At least that's what I keep telling myself, but we have some time for you to do that. Let's start off with an introduction. So who is Jimmy Daly and, and what is Superpath? Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm Jimmy. Uh, I live in Vail, Colorado. About three and a half or four months ago, I started a business called Superpath. I spent the last 10 or gosh, 10 or 11 years working in content marketing, which is a field I've encourage people to check out and learn more about. I'm happy to go on and on about. Sure. And uh, this new company, Superpath, is is actually designed to be a career resource for folks who work in content marketing. Um, as part of that, we have blog, newsletter, podcast, and we also have a paid professional development program where folks get access to courses and networking opportunities and office hours with experienced content operators. Yeah. That's super cool. So actually, now let's, let's talk about content for a bit. A lot of students listening to this, they're aware of marketing, but they probably don't understand the different aspects that can go into a marketing team. So when you say content marketing, what, is, what does that mean? It's so hard to pin down exactly what content means because, and I, sorry, I'm like, this is no. the wrong way to answer this question, but it's sort of, <laughs> it's sort of nuanced. I mean, yeah. what has happened is that so many companies rely on content via the written word, video, and audio to reach customers and potential customers. And mm-hmm. so the role that I primarily work in is B2B SaaS content marketing, meaning uh, these are software companies yep. selling apps uh, to other businesses. And they rely on, uh, they, they tend to rely on blogs and podcasts to create awareness, kind of like just broad awareness of what they're doing. Uh, then they create eBooks and guides and white papers and things like that to speak to folks who are actually considering buying their products. And then they usually are using emails or other forms of content to communicate with folks who are maybe in a free trial or as part of a sales process. And so a lot of these software companies have whole teams of content marketers who are working on different parts of that marketing funnel. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a question for you. We don't see it very much yet in B2B SaaS, but I bet a lot of the people that are listening to this now are going to be the ones kind of doing this in a few years. Do you see TikTok becoming something that a content marketer is going to need to do or be proficient in, in let's say five years from now? Probably not. And, and the reason I feel fairly confident saying that is because so few social channels have made their way into B2B marketing successfully. Yeah. Now, if you're going to end up working in B2C marketing, like, you know, say you're working for a direct to consumer startup where yep. uh, you're selling mattresses and shoes and like things directly to an individual, Mm -hmm. probably, you know, you'll need to know TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, all those things Mm -hmm. in our, in the B2B world, we rely pretty heavily on LinkedIn and Twitter. So you need to know those. Well, they're the the things that make for a great TikTok marketer. If if that's even a thing yet Mm -hmm. are going to be some of the same things though, that make for a great content marketer anyways. Yeah. Right. It's like, can you tell a story in a very short period of time? Can you capture attention? Can you, catalyze action based on the content you create, things like that. Yeah, no, it was actually a great way to answer it. And I just reminded myself, we should B2B, uh, business to business. So selling something that another business would purchase for their business, whereas B2C, business to consumer, like Jimmy was just talking about, maybe you have a Shopify store or you're selling something direct to consumer, they want to buy a pair of shoes, stuff like that, right? So exactly, no, yeah. It, it comes down to storytelling. So whatever the platform Always. is in five years, there's probably something we don't even know about yet. So. Definitely. What, one interesting thing about B2B yeah. is that it, in so many ways, it's similar to B2C because you're still marketing to individuals. Like even though you're selling a piece of software to a business, it's on the other end of that is still 
human. human beings who buy based on some of the same needs and interests and desires that an individual consumer would. So I would encourage folks, like I was actually scared off by B2B marketing early in my career because it just sounded sort of boring. It, it turns out that's not the case at all. It's all of the same like psychology that goes into kind of the, the Nike or like kind of like whatever other big name marketing campaigns you might think of, like all that same stuff is going into B2B marketing. You know, I think that's a message that more people need to be reminded of, whether you're selling to somebody who works in procurement or accounting, and it might be the most boring thing in, in your world. It's still another human who's watching that same trashy reality TV show on Netflix at night, right? Yep. So have the same human emotions that are going to drive us regardless of what you're selling, right? Absolutely. Cool. Well, speaking of uh, marketing, content marketing, and this could be a good segue, kind of talk about your journey, but let's say I'm a high school student listening to this. I, I'm interested in marketing. I'm interested in telling stories and in influencing decisions through my writing. What's a pathway that you would recommend to a, a high school student who says, I want to be a content marketer when I get a little bit older? That's such an interesting question because yeah. so many of the folks who I know in this industry have discovered it by accident somewhere in their mid twenties. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume that that will happen less and less as the content marketing world becomes more legitimate. Like it is now a legitimate industry. And I, yeah. so I imagine like the next wave of people are potentially going to come out of college and go right into content versus like me kind of stumbling around the first few years after college, having absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. And then yeah. kind of finding this by accident. The, the one thing that I would encourage a younger person to do is to learn to write. Yeah. Content marketing is, is that is really the only hard skill you need is the ability to write. Whether you, you know, end up pursuing a career in content marketing or not, that skill is going to serve you very, very well because all of the work that we do kind of regardless of the field, there's just such a heavy writing component for some folks. It's just emails or whatever, but for many of us, it's, it's presentations, it's Slack messages, it's blog posts, it's, you know, scripts, yeah. it's webinars. There's so many, so many valuable things you can do if you can write well. Okay. So what are, two, three books right now that a high school student could pick up and, and read to help improve some of their copywriting? My favorite one is one that's called On Writing Well by a guy named William Zinzer. It's a really good book. It's, it doesn't read, it's not a textbook. It's, sure. it's entertaining. It's interesting. He offers all kinds of very practical ways to improve your writing. So I would definitely encourage folks to read that. And then I would also, also potentially encourage folks to read a book called Good to Great, which I keep on my bookshelf up there. Yeah for a few reasons. One is you just learn so many good business fundamentals in that book. Yeah. Those like I reference that book frequently. Also, it's a great example of good writing in practice. And so sometimes I find that like, if I love reading a book, I start realizing, why do I love, like, why do I like this so much? And then you can sort of start like studying, like, you know, how does this author open up each chapter? You know, what are kind of the key lines that stand out to me? And like, how did that author build up to that? How do they kind of reach that crescendo? Like there's so many things you can learn just by studying a book that you enjoy. Yeah. So that's another one that I'd recommend. Those are great. You know, I don't think I heard of that first one. We just did a recent podcast and the skill of copywriting came up and we talked about cash advertising. We talked about Cialdini's influence. Like there's so many good books and copywriting seems to be making a bit of a resurgence or it's becoming bit more mainstream, more popular. So there's lots of good stuff out there. And then I'm sure there's some great stuff on Superpath to invest in if you want to get better at those skills as well. Right? Yes, definitely. <laughs> All right. So Jimmy, let's talk about the hog. So the hog is something that we do at my blueprint during our meetings to make them a bit more efficient. We label each of the agenda items with a certain amount of time that we're going to speak to that. And then we have to label it either as an update, uh, discussion, decision, or once a meeting, we get to speak to the hog where there's something a bit more important that week that's going to demand a bit more of our time. I think this is a great opportunity for you to talk about your journey and what you studied in, in post-secondary and why that's still so relevant regardless of what anybody says. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. So I, I was an English major and to be very frank with you, I was a bad student. <laughs> I really was. I, and I, this is not something that I would encourage, you know, if you're going to bother going to university apply yourself because it probably is going to cost a fortune and you may spend many years afterwards paying for it. So it is worth your time to apply yourself and try to do well in school. Yeah. I was an English major because I hated taking tests and I enjoyed writing. That was it. Like that was as far as I thought this through. I had no idea what I was going to do after school. I had no idea what, like what my career might actually look like. 
Mm-hmm. I thought for a while that I wanted to be a teacher. And so when I graduated college, I got a job as a substitute teacher and I hated it. Mm. So I spent a year doing that. And, you know, it, 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 in some ways it was a frustrating year. In other ways, I learned that it's not what I wanted to do. So that's good. And check that off the list and go do something else. Yeah. But I still had that. There was still something in me that said, like, I like, I like teaching and, and coaching Interestingly, like you fast forward about 12 years, that's actually what I'm doing now. I, I just like, I didn't have enough expertise in any particular area to educate or coach someone at that point. So yeah. anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I got a job through a family friend as an intern uh, at a company that sold gluten-free flour online. And this is like, I didn't really realize it at the time, but this is like direct to consumer startup in like 2008 or yeah. so, like when that wasn't really a thing yet. Yeah. And most of the time I was just like making trips to the post office, but eventually I got the uh, opportunity to start writing our email newsletters. And so I, I started learning a lot about copywriting because, you know, you got to figure out how to get people to open based on a good subject line. You have to figure out how to get them to click. You have to figure out how to get them to go from open to click to purchase. And there's a lot that goes into that. Then I got the opportunity to start working on the website I started learning a little bit about SEO, which stands for search engine optimization. That's how it's kind of like the game you play to get search engines to rank your, your website well in a search result. Yeah. And I just loved all this stuff. And so it, it was interestingly, it was like the first time I had ever applied myself, like really applied myself in something outside of sports. Like I had always applied, like really like invested and committed to athletics, mm. uh, but I'd never really done it at school or work. And I actually loved it. Like once I found something that I was like intrigued by, I just ran with it. And that led to another job where I actually got to work in an agency and work on SEO and marketing for a bunch of clients. So I learned a ton and then I went in-house and then I went back to an agency and then I went in-house again and then I went back to an agency and then eventually I started my own business. So, you know, there's sort of 10 years of building up experience. Now Now I do feel like I'm in a position to educate and coach others who are a little earlier on in their journey. Yep. So kind of in a weird way, I did end up doing the thing that I, I thought I loved, but it looks completely different than what I imagined. Here's a question for you then. Do I still need to go study four years of an English degree if I want to work in copywriting or content marketing then kind of in following your journey? Like is what you learned in university going to still be relevant? Should I still study English? You know what? I don't know. I really yeah, don't know. It's a tough one. Yeah. The, I think there's a case to be made on both sides. On one hand, I really didn't, I never even heard the term content marketing until several years after college. Never. So I didn't learn anything about it. You know, the type of writing that you do in college is very different because you have one reader and it's a guaranteed reader. Yeah. And the biggest difference once you get out in the real world is that you have, ideally you have many readers, but you start with zero. And you have to earn readers because your writing is good enough that people care to read it. And and that's a really big difference. So while I did get the chance to do a lot of writing, which is good, I didn't, I don't think I really left school with great writing skills. Like those came later on as it had the opportunity to do a lot of testing to see what, what resonated with readers and didn't had editors that helped me a lot and things like that. But I think, I think the case for going is that, and I'm speaking really just for me personally, Had I not gone to school, say I hadn't gone to college at all, I don't think that I would have ended up on this same path, which is a path that I really loved. And I don't think I would have, I don't think anyone would have hired me to be, to come work at their gluten-free flour (laughs) startup. And I don't think, and if I hadn't had that opportunity, it wouldn't have led to the next one. And so there's something to be said for the trajectory, you know, and so like coming out of school as an English major, like I probably got my first two or three jobs by saying, hey, I'm an English major, I know how to write. Hmm. You know, I can do this or that for your website or your marketing. Opened up some doors. It opened up like just enough doors that I could then like gain traction. And so I think, you know, I I hate to say, spend $100,000 so you can get one job that you probably hate that might lead to something better later. But I I do feel like there's something to be said there. Now, if you're a good student, unlike myself, you can probably learn a lot more and come out with way better skills than I did. No, uh, that's fair. I appreciate that. My story is kind of very similar. I, my undergrad, I thought I was going to law school. So I I did an undergrad in criminal justice and and public policy, not doing that whatsoever, but the decisions and the opportunities that I had as a result of being there and the doors that were opened 
and the things that I had to do as a result are what allowed me to get to where I am today. So as much as there uh, still needs to be um, post-secondary and education in general needs to be shaken up a little bit, it still is the right path for a lot of people. So just do what feels right for you. Right? Yeah, I agree uh, with that. I wonder if we can, I don't know how to phrase this, but you touched on a little bit and I've never heard of that. There's a guaranteed reader when you're writing in, in post-secondary, same thing with high school as well, right? But the way that I think you're, you're taught to write kind of a formal essay and the way that you're probably writing as a content marketer are very different. Like one of the things that um, I'm trying to get a lot of people on our team to, to do, whether they're writing internally, like you're talking about on Slack or email, or if it's for external, is to just write like you talk, you know, talk, talk. again, whether you're selling to procurement or somebody in marketing, it's a human in the day. But I feel like when I was in high school and I'm writing essays, it's therefore I would, you know, it was very formal yeah. uh, type writing. So was that just a natural shift where you, you started working at that direct to consumer flower company and you realized that for someone to open your email, if it sounded like a big essay that you're handing in your professor, it probably wouldn't get read. And then you had to kind of make the shift or, or where did you make that realization? Yeah, this is interesting because in school, like a, a teacher or professor says, okay, we're going to write a paper on this or that. And the first thing that everybody says is how long does it have to be? And they say it has to be right. 10 pages or 15 pages. Yeah. And then like, I would write like two pages and be like, I've said every, I don't know what else to say. And then I'm like trying to figure out, can I make the font a little bit bigger, yeah. increase the line space? Like, how can I draw this out? Yeah. So it's actually somewhat of relief to get into the marketing world and find out that actually what readers prefer is the exact opposite. They want as much information in the shortest period of time that they can possibly get. Yeah. So that, I think that was actually part of why I gravitated towards marketing was because I, it, it was sort of nice to say, I have something to say and I'm going to say it in the fewest words I possibly can. And that's actually like a very interesting challenge to me. I think it's harder. It's yeah. way harder. Yeah. And it's way more fun to work on than trying to figure out like, how am I going to draw this essay out to be another yeah. page when I really don't have anything else to say? Yeah. Um, so it actually felt quite natural. And I, I would imagine for others, it will too. I, I mean, unless you're the type that just like loves writing and you just like it so much that you could just go on and on. I mean, that's sort of a skill you may have to unlearn a little yeah. later on. Uh, I wasn't like that. Like I always felt like I'm not wasting my time doing this. It's going to take forever. And no one cares except the one person who's going to read it and then give me a grade on it. So I like the idea of, I like the idea of earning attention through good writing is very, very different and, and a lot more fun. What can, uh, can a 16 year old who's listening to this do to start practicing is just setting up a blog and just start writing about whatever they're passionate about or that's a, I love that idea. I would encourage, I will, I do encourage everyone who participates in our professional development stuff at Superpath mm -hmm. to start and or maintain a personal blog for a bunch of reasons. I mean, mm -hmm. one, it's just this sandbox that you can play in. You can, you know, you can explore your own ideas without all of the constraints that come along with a work project. And two, you, you do start developing I, and I hate this term and I'm sorry, I'm going to use it. A personal brand. Right. It's actually something that's really important in the marketing world. And we need to come up with a better yeah. version of it, but this is how you start to make a name and a reputation for yourself. Marketing is, is cool because in many ways you get to work in public. Like if you search my name on the internet, you're going to find hundreds and hundreds of articles that I've written. That's my portfolio. And so yeah. I collect a lot of that stuff on a personal blog, or I might write about how I did something or why I did something or what I learned doing something. And, and just kind of like documenting those things is it's good for your quote unquote brand. It's good for you to document your learning. It's just a space that's your, and so yeah, I would definitely encourage people to do that. For all those reasons. And you're just sharpening the saw, right? You're practicing the skill. And when you have that brand, cause you know, employers will Google your name these days, right? They're probably looking for bad things, but if they have lots of good things to find, that's only going to help. Definitely. So, Speaking of hiring, so obviously you're involved in a lot of hiring decisions, whether it's hiring for the companies you've worked for the last few years or with Superpath trying to get other people hired to other types of jobs, right? So here's a, a question for you, Jimmy. Let's say you're hiring for a role on your team and you have two exact resumes. They look, the, they look identical on paper. What have you learned over the years? Like what's that skill that you're looking for that's going to separate one candidate from the other? That's a good and difficult question. <laughs> there I mean, to me, so many of the jobs that I'm, so it, just to, for context, like one of the things that our company does is, is help source candidates for open content marketing roles. And so mm -hmm. I look at a lot of resumes and a lot of writing samples. 
Resumes don't tend to tell you that much, but you can learn a lot from writing samples. You can learn a lot just by seeing which samples a person chooses, because if they choose, if they show you a certain type of writing sample that doesn't at all line up with the type of job that they're trying to get, then right. it's like right off the bat, I know that either you don't have the necessary experience or you just didn't even read the job care. application. So yeah. that's one thing. The, the other thing is that I feel like I've looked at enough of these now that I can sniff out a kind of a fluffy writing sample in two seconds, you know, and there's, there's a few characteristics of those things that, that are pretty easy to find. Like, for example, if an article starts with a line, something like, it's no secret that X, Y, Z is happening in 2020. Like, I, I can't believe how often I see that. And like, to yeah. me, that's like X, you're done. Right. I, I don't, this tells me that you have no idea who's on the other side of this and what they care about. It's just like the most overused introductory line in an article. It's, it just drives me crazy. There's another thing where, that I love seeing, which is when someone uses the title and or the intro of a piece to present a new perspective that I've never seen before. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I, I don't know exactly how to pin down. It's, it's not like the sentence structure. It's not the grammar. It's the idea, the insight. Mm. And if they're able to identify a new perspective, an interesting insight, just something cool that has not been written about a billion times already, that I, it, it sticks out. Like it's like this shining light that I just makes me so happy. I can send examples of this if you want to, to show you what a good and a bad one looks like. Um, That'd be great. We can throw it in uh, the show notes. I, yeah. I think I know what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's hard to pin it down, but it's almost like that person has found their own kind of unique voice, right? If they're starting off with that cheese ball sentence that you've heard a thousand times and they're just trying to do what they think is right. Whereas that other person found that unique voice, they, they have the creativity. They're going to do something that others aren't, which is what's going to cut through the noise these days and actually get people's attention. So definitely cool, cool thing to look out for. Yeah, definitely. And just one other quick thought on that is yeah. one thing that when of all the people that I've ever worked with, there's a few that have stood out and they have this, and I think, I think we may touch on this. They have this very soft skill that I would think is best described as situational awareness. They're able to read the room and they're able to make good decisions based on that quick analysis. So like as an example, the person who reads the job description and then selects the right writing sample, sometimes that's even more important than the quality of the writing sample. Yeah. You know, and, and there's kind of the same thing with a, with a cover letter where so you get cover letters that just feel so templated and boring. Yeah. Like the person literally Googled cover letter template and copied <laughs> it. And then you, you get some that are, that are so contextual. Like the person looked, like researched the company and, and tried yeah. to understand the role and looked at other people who work there and, and are able to, they, they kind of do this like quick situational analysis and are able to make a really good decision based on that. That's just like this very undervalued skill. So like, that's the kind of thing that it, it helps in hiring. It helps in work. It helps in life and, and marriage and all these other things, but situational awareness. And the best way I describe this is imagine LeBron James driving to the basket for a routine layup something yeah. he's done thousands of times in his career. I bet you that he could dissect that five second period for 10 minutes every single time. Yeah. He could tell you where the defenders are on the court. He could tell you what quarter it is, how much time is left, what game in the season, is, you know, what play were they supposed to be running? Like he understands the situation so well and it allows him to see the game slower than everybody else. That's the kind of thing that I look for. And, it's hard to pin down, but it is, it, you know it when you see it. I think situational awareness is a great way to at least categorize it. Yeah. I know you're talking about. Speaking of skills, what's a life skill that you weren't taught in high school, but maybe you wish you were? Mm, wow. So many, so many. <laughs> I'll, I'll pull an example from marriage because I think that's actually ends up being like incredibly relevant. You, whether mm-hmm. you get married or not, just like the way you handle relationships, personal, professional, whatever, mm-hmm. which is to when you're married and your spouse reacts in an unexpected way to something, and this happens all the time, you know, I say something and my wife, it, it, it pisses her off or she says something and I'm like, Hey, wait a minute. There's always a reason for that. And, and I feel like patience, curiosity, you know, the, the desire to like kind of peel back the layers to find out why, why a person reacts or, or, or just acts in the way that they do. Yeah is a skill that is just so incredibly valuable because this happens at work 
all the time. You have you, people react in ways and you're like, well, I can't believe that they blew me off like that. You know, sent me down this path on this useless project. I can't believe that my boss said that to me. I can't believe this or that. And it, there's always more to it. And it kind of, I guess it kind of gets to that situational awareness thing where like the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes and try to understand where they're coming from is just, is just such a valuable life skill. And uh, yeah. I definitely did not learn that in high school. No, that's fair. And it's a great way to frame it. I mean, a lot of people will speak to that as empathy and, and with your life partner, your, your husband, your wife, whoever, you're probably, you hopefully are going to care enough to uncover the why, that curiosity piece of why they get upset so that it doesn't happen again or that you guys can make up. But in, in business relationships, you're not going to be as invested all the time in that person as you are with your, your spouse. So it's uh, being intentional about still wanting to understand why they were upset because well, teamwork makes a dream work. So you all totally, have the same page, totally. right? And Applies equally in marketing too, by the way, like, you know, understanding where your customers are coming from, understanding why they bought your product, why they needed it in the first place, what they're right. getting at. Like there's it's the exact same thing. It's like just the ability to like think outside of your own, your own situation, which is like sample size of one it is super valuable. 100%. Yeah. Okay. Let's do some, some rapid fire questions for you, Jimmy. So stole this one from Tim Ferriss. You can write anything on a billboard. Everyone's going to see it. What does that billboard say? It says, don't think, just run. That's something my high school track coach used to say to us because it, like we would get in our heads so much about like, what pace should I go? Like, what was my first lap going to look right. like? What about the guy next to me? This and that. And he would just say, don't think, just run. And I feel like <laughs> I, I, it, it applies in a lot of areas in life. Like don't get inside your head too much. Just keep going. Yeah. There was a point in my life where I was tempted of to get the just do it like Nike uh, slogan tattooed on myself, just as a reminder, just don't overthink it. Just do it. Right? I love Luck it. Luckily I didn't, but <laughs> <laughs> IQ. So intelligent quotient or EQ emotional quotient. You can only pick one. Which one are you picking? EQ every day, all day. Yep. It's hundred percent. It's a home run. Yeah. Maybe it was English. Did you have a favorite class in high school? English, yes. I went to a Catholic high school and we had a few religion classes that were basically just debate. Cool. I actually loved that. Like we had a theology class when I was in high school, which basically was debate. And I, yeah. I loved it. I mean, it was just like, I loved that forum for people to argue in a healthy way. And interestingly, that's something that's come up in my career too. Like encouraging people to argue in a healthy way actually is really productive because in workplace situations, people tend to be sometimes shy, sometimes kind of unwilling to speak up. And so yeah. I learned this from my former boss who would, who would argue with you just because he didn't even believe what he was arguing. He would just do it to make you really think through your decisions and make sure you had thought about both sides of it. And so, yeah, I love that. I think the skill to be able to have a healthy, respectful debate is something that not enough people have these days. So I Definitely. Could, not, could not agree more with that. We talked about a few books, What's a book that you've read now, but maybe you it was so impactful that you would have wished you had read it before you were 18? I read a book a few years ago called Atomic Habits by yeah. a guy named James Clear. And this has become like a fairly popular book now. Oh, nice. Yeah, you've got it right there. <laughs> yeah, I just I think that it. book is so fantastic. Yeah. It just never really occurred to me that like the entire trajectory of, of your life is based on the little things you do every day. And if yeah. you are able to just change a few little things, it can change the, the entire course of your life in a good way. So yeah, I love that book. Do you have a habit you can speak to that you developed since reading that book that has, has had a big impact? I guess a couple things. One is walking. I walk a lot and I just find it's such a good way to clear my head, breathe some fresh air, get the blood flowing a little bit. So something mm -hmm. I do quite a bit. I have a dog, so that's easy. Like every day at lunchtime, we're out the door on our walk. Cool. That, that's probably the biggest one. That's pretty funny because it's uh, mine too. I wrote a LinkedIn post after I just reread Atomic Habits talking about how much I love the book and that the one habit that I was willing to speak of now that I'm working at home, we don't have a commute anymore. So every morning when I wake up, I do a commute. And whether I'm listening to a podcast or a book or just thinking to myself, it's made a huge impact. Right? That's so, awesome. Yeah. Uh, hypothetical scenario for you, Jimmy. You're the superintendent of a school board and you're tasked with deciding one competency or, or one skill that each of your graduating students need to display evidence of in their digital portfolio. Um, oh, what's that interesting. One skill? 
Interesting. I think it's probably sales. Oh. Yeah, I think it's probably sales because I, I spent the first eight years of my career primarily as a writer. And then I spent two years primarily doing sales. So I was, I was selling content marketing services like mm-hmm. on behalf of the company I was working for. And I learned more in that two years than I did in the eight prior. No question about it because, you know, you don't really know, you don't really know what people want until you get on the phone with them. And you don't, and you don't really understand them until you start asking better questions. And there's just so much in there about like just understanding the human condition, you know, building relationships with people, learning how to help people, yeah. even if it means you don't benefit from it. There's just, there's so much baked into sales, also failing a lot, which, yeah. is, which is good. Yeah. You know, it's good because you, you learn a lot of good lessons from it. So yeah, I think it'd probably be sales. I love that. I'm personally biased. I do a lot of sales in the role that I have at my blueprint right now. And I love to preach that sales skills are life skills. And we've had a few episodes in people in sales professions that I'll link to in the show notes that can kind of speak to that. But you know, sales isn't um, what you think it is from oh, what's the DiCaprio movie, Wolf of Wall Street. Like it, yeah, it's, not, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not that kind of stuff. It's having real conversations with people, being an active listener, figuring out what their problems are. And if your solution can actually help to solve those problems to add value to that person's life, that's all sales really is. Right. So exactly. Yeah. Huge skills, but yeah, you're going to learn how to be told. No, you're going to learn to persevere. You're going to learn time management. There's so many amazing skills that come from that. So that's a good answer. Let's finish it off, Jimmy. So if I was 18 again, I would. Travel. And I know that's a little hard to do that right now, just kind of given the state of the world, but I didn't really get out of my cocoon until I met my wife in my twenties and and she was just so hungry to travel. And so I obviously was tagging along with her and it it just like seeing the world opened my eyes to so much. I mean, we started with the U S and we traveled all over the U S and then we started moving all over the U S and then we started traveling abroad and, yeah, I wish I had done that sooner. I really wish I had done that sooner. Whether it's, you know, gap year or right after college or, or whatever, but you just learn. So the world is just so, I mean, this sounds dumb, but like the world is so much bigger than you could possibly imagine. Yeah. And it's so amazing to go yeah. and see how other people live and how different their lives are than you. It's just awesome. No, that's a great answer. And eventually the world will bounce back and we'll be able to travel again. But yeah, when when you don't travel, you live inside of a bubble with the same perspectives and the same stories and just being able to travel will open your eyes to a lot of different cultures, a lot of different ways of thinking and just new experiences that will forever benefit you in this weird marathon that we call life. So um, don't overthink it. Just do it. Jimmy Daly, thank you for making time to share your story with the future change makers of this world. Again, we're going to link to it in the show notes, but superpath.co content marketing, B2B SaaS, all the acronyms and lots more. Have a great one, I guess.